Veracemi is one of the three magic systems present on Skadriel, the planet that Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn series takes place on. It is perhaps the most versatile of the three metallic arts, with its applications ranging from fighting to scholarship. In this video, we will explore Ferrochemy's mechanics, discuss how ferrochemical abilities are gained, learn about each of the ferrochemical metals, and discover the origins and history of Ferrochemy. Mechanics Of the three magic systems on Skadriel, Ferrochemy is the second most common. It is an end-neutral magic system, meaning that power is neither gained nor lost when practicing the art. People who are able to practice ferrochemy are known as ferrochemists. They have the ability to use pieces of metal as a kind of battery, filling them with attributes of themselves that they can then withdraw at a later time. Different types of metal store different attributes. For instance, iron stores weight, pewter stores strength, and brass stores warmth. We will go over each ferrochemical metal and the attributes they store in greater detail later in the video. A piece of metal that a ferrochemist has stored an attribute in is known as a metal mind. Metal mines can vary greatly in size, but the bigger they are, the more of an attribute they can hold. Impure metals can still be made into metal mines, but the less pure they are, the less of a ferrochemical charge they will hold. Specific metal mines are named after the metal they are made of. So an iron metal mind is called an iron mind, a brass metal mind is called a brass mind, and so on. In order for a ferrochemist to store or access an attribute in one of their metal mines, they must be touching that piece of metal. Because of this, many ferrochemists choose to wear their metal mines as jewelry, often in the form of metal bracers around their arms and legs, rings on their fingers, and piercings in their ears and face. As they are actively filling a metal mind with an attribute, that attribute becomes diminished. This is because the power they are storing is coming directly from their body. This can look quite extreme depending on the attribute being stored. For example, when a ferrochemist fills a pewter mind with strength, they seem to deflate, their muscles growing weak and scrawny. As soon as they stop filling that pewter mind, their muscles return to normal size and strength. A ferrochemist can choose how much of an attribute they store at once, but it has to be at a reasonable rate. It's common for them to store 25% of an attribute, leaving them with 75% of that attribute to work with while they're filling their metal mind. The act of withdrawing a reserve of an attribute back out of a metal mind is known as tapping. When a ferrochemist is actively tapping one of their reserves, that attribute is increased. If that same ferrochemist who stored up strength in a pewter mine decides to tap that strength reserve, their muscles will increase in size and they will become considerably stronger until they either release the power or it runs out. Ferrochemy is a very balanced art, meaning that you typically get out what you put in. If a ferrochemist spends one hour storing 50% of their weight in an iron mine, they can tap that reserve at a later time to be 150% of their normal weight for an hour. They can also choose to tap a reserve at an accelerated rate, but if they do that, some of the power is lost. For instance, that same ferrochemist who stored 50% of their weight for one hour might only be able to tap it to make themselves weigh 200% of their normal weight for 25 minutes rather than a full half hour, or 250% for 10 minutes. The quicker they tap a reserve, the more power is lost. Even with this loss, ferrochemy can be very powerful. There's no upper limit to how much of a reserve a ferrochemist can tap at once. They just won't be able to use it for as long. In the books, we've seen a ferrochemist draw in days worth of stored weight in a single moment, making himself heavier than a building. Ordinarily, a ferrochemist's metal mind is keyed to their identity. This makes them inaccessible to other ferrochemists, although those other ferrochemists are still able to tell that there is a ferrochemical charge stored within the metal. They'll see a kind of shadow of the reserve, but won't be able to access the power itself. There's a special type of metal mind known as an unkeyed metal mind that isn't limited to one ferrochemist. As the name suggests, they aren't keyed to any specific identity. Their creation requires a ferrochemist to manipulate their identity using aluminum ferrochemy. There's another type of metal mine that takes this one step further and can be used by anyone, whether they're a ferrochemist or not. These are called unsealed metal mines. The exact method for creating one of these isn't known yet, but it likely involves ferrochemical aluminum, nicrosil, duralumin, and a device called an excisor. We'll probably learn more about these special metal mines in Mistborn Era 3. Gaining 
ferrochemical abilities. The most common way to gain ferrochemical abilities is to simply be born with them. Ferrochemy is a spiritually hereditary trait, meaning that it's passed on through spiritual DNA. A person has to have terrace ancestors to have the chance of being born with ferrochemy, though even then it's extremely rare. It's pretty easy for an individual to find out if they have ferrochemical abilities. They just need to go around touching a bunch of different metals. If they can use a metal ferrochemically, they'll feel a kind of empathy for that metal when touching it. Another way a person can gain the powers of ferrochemy is through the use of hemallergic spikes. These spikes steal the spiritual DNA associated with ferrochemy from one person and transfers it to another. This method of gaining ferrochemical abilities is rather unethical because it not only steals the ability from the first person, it also kills them in the process. We'll be covering hemallergy in detail in a future video, so be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on post notifications so you'll know when that video is posted. There's a third way to gain ferrochemical abilities that involves the use of the two Skadrian god metals, Lurassium and Atium. I think it most likely involves alloying the two god metals in some way and then either consuming the metal or tapping it, but as of right now, it's a mystery. Types of Ferrochemists There are two classifications of ferrochemists, those who can store attributes in all the ferrochemical metals, known as full ferrochemists, and those who can only store an attribute in a single ferrochemical metal, known as fairings. The only known methods to access a combination of ferrochemical powers that falls outside of these two classifications is through the use of hemallergy or unsealed metal mines. During the time periods of classical Skadriel and the Final Empire, everyone who was born with ferrochemical powers was a full ferrochemist. This was because the terrorist bloodlines were very pure due to the terrorist people staying isolated keeping the spiritual DNA very strong. After the Catasandra, however, the terrorist people began to interbreed with the general population, and the spiritual DNA responsible for ferrochemy began to weaken. By the time of Mistborn Era II, there are no longer any full ferrochemists, and instead, fairings have began to appear in the population. Each type of fairing has been given a particular name depending on their ability, such as Steel Runner, Skimmer, or Fire Soul. We'll go over each of the names and the metal they are associated with when we talk about the ferrochemical metals. After terrorist genetics got introduced into the general population, it became possible for a person with both terrorist and noble heritage to be born with one ferrochemical ability and one allomantic ability. Those lucky few people are known as twinborn. Ferrochemical metals. There are 16 basic ferrochemical metals. The metals can be divided into four groups of four metals each, based on the attributes they store. These groups are physical, cognitive, spiritual, and hybrid. We'll start with the physical group of metals. Iron allows a ferrochemist to store physical weight, reducing their effective weight while actively storing. This reduction of weight can be very useful when falling from heights because their surface area remains the same while their mass is reduced, so wind resistance slows their fall enough to land safely. It can also help when climbing up things such as trees. They can tap their reserve at a later time to increase their effective weight. A ferrochemist can use this increased weight to add momentum to attacks when fighting, make themselves harder to push or pull, and even to fall on top of an enemy while greatly increasing their weight, crushing their enemy's bones. An iron fairing is known as a skimmer. Steel allows a ferrochemist to store physical speed, draining their body of speed and making every motion, even their breathing, more difficult while actively storing. Since you can't do much while moving incredibly slowly, speed is one of the most difficult attributes to store up. Ferrochemists will often enter a kind of meditative trance while filling difficult metal mines. They can tap this speed reserve at a later time to increase their speed substantially. We see how useful steel ferrochemy can be in the Well of Ascension when Sazed used months worth of speed to travel the equivalent of six weeks worth of walking in just six days. A steel fairing is known as a steel runner. Tin allows a ferrochemist to store the acuity of one of their five senses. A different tin mind must be used for each sense. While storing, their acuity in that sense is reduced. Actively storing a sense can be useful at times. For instance, 
A ferrochemist can store their sense of smell when there is a bad odor in the air to prevent themselves from gagging. On the other hand, actively storing the sense of sight can be a hindrance, and ferrochemists will often wear spectacles to compensate for their reduced eyesight. The Well of Ascension has a great chapter showing what it's like to store all five senses at once. It seems like a terrible experience. When tapping a tin mind, the sense it stores is enhanced. Some of the most useful applications of tin ferrochemy are tapping hearing to listen in on conversations and tapping eyesight to see the details of things far off in the distance. When tapping eyesight, the edges of the ferrochemist's vision fuzzes, but things directly in front of them seem to grow much closer. Tapping a lot of eyesight at once will make the ferrochemist feel nauseous. A tin fairing is known as a wind whisperer. Pewter allows a ferrochemist to store physical strength, reducing their strength while actively storing and causing their muscles to shrink. This can be a difficult attribute to store since being extremely weak can make it hard to do daily activities. Because of this, the terrace Pac-Man of classical Scadrial would make themselves weaker in the evenings before sleeping in order to store up strength to use the next day. When a ferrochemist taps their pewter mind, they gain muscle mass and become physically larger. Tapping extreme amounts of strength can make the ferrochemist grow to nearly the size of a coloss, but being that large can make it difficult to walk. Metal mines are often built to expand so they can accommodate for this increased size, with braces and rings not connecting on one side so they can bend. Full ferrochemist warriors prior to the Catasandra would commonly wear a pair of bracelets, one iron, one pewter, around their ankles. A pewter fairing is known as a brute. Next, we'll talk about the cognitive group of metals. Zinc allows a ferrochemist to store mental speed, dulling their ability to think and reason while actively storing. This can make conversations more difficult, as it takes a while to process the words people are saying. They can tap their zinc mind at a later time to think very quickly and work through problems much faster than normal. A zinc fairing is known as a sparker. Brass allows a ferrochemist to store warmth, cooling themselves off while actively storing. This can be useful if the ferrochemist is in a hot climate or if they're around a source of heat, such as a fire. They can tap their brass mind at a later time to warm themselves. This can be used to walk around in frigid temperatures without the need for warm clothing. A brass fairing is known as a fire soul. Copper allows a ferrochemist to store memories. They can take mental images, thoughts, or sounds that are fresh in their mind, then store them away. The sensation feels like they are sucked from their mind, leaving a blank hollowness behind, and they won't be able to remember the specifics of what they stored away. They can tap memories stored in their copper mind at a later time and recall them with crisp clarity, as clear as they were when they were first placed in the copper mind, but they will begin to decay the longer they are out of the copper mind. To help reduce this decaying, ferrochemists will often dump some of the memories into their mind, make a note of the relevant information, and then redeposit the memories back into the copper mind. Reading the note tells them what they had just forgotten. Ferrochemists can also create indexes and gazetteers within their copper mines to help them quickly find information stored within them. Copper ferrochemy was the most important ferrochemical ability during the final empire, allowing the keepers to preserve pre-ascension knowledge. A copper fairing is known as an archivist. Bronze allows a ferrochemist to store wakefulness, making themselves drowsy while actively storing. This is the only type of metal mind that can be filled while the ferrochemist sleeps, and doing so will force them to sleep longer. They can tap the bronze mind at a later time to reduce drowsiness or to heighten their awareness. If a ferrochemist has enough wakefulness stored up, they can stay awake for days on end. In the Well of Ascension, we see one use it to stay awake for a week straight during an intense study session. A bronze fairing is known as a sentry. The third group is the spiritual group of metals. Duralumin allows a ferrochemist to store spiritual connection, reducing other people's awareness and friendship with them during active storage. This could prove useful in espionage situations when a ferrochemist doesn't want to be recognized. They can tap their Duralumin mind at a later time to speedily form trust relationships with others. We've also seen Southern Skadrians tap unsealed Duralumin minds to enable them to speak the local language in foreign lands, though they still retain their accent. A Duralumin fairing is known as a connector. 
Aluminum allows a ferrochemist to store their spiritual sense of identity. This ferrochemical metal is not well understood, and it's rarely spoken of outside of terrorist communities. Though, we do know that aluminum ferrochemy is involved in the creation of unkeyed metal mines. An aluminum fairing is known as a true self. Nicrosil allows a ferrochemist to store investiture. Similar to aluminum ferrochemy, the powers of nicrosil ferrochemy are also not understood very well, even by the people of Terrace. Nicrosil ferrochemy seems to be a necessary component for the creation of unsealed metal mines. A nicrosil fairing is known as a soul bearer. Chromium allows a ferrochemist to store fortune, making themselves unlucky while actively storing. They can tap their chromium mind at a later time to increase their luck. This could be particularly useful for making money through gambling. A chromium fairing is known as a spinner. The fourth and final group of metals is the hybrid group. Gold allows a ferrochemist to store health, causing them to be sickly and weak while actively storing. Gold ferrochemists will often spend extended periods of time in bed feeling wretched so they can store up as much health as possible. They can tap their gold mind at a later time to quickly heal from wounds such as gunshots, knife stabs, and broken bones. It can also be used for recovering from diseases, but it is much less effective at that. Those lucky few people who possess both gold ferrochemy and gold allomancy can compound their ferrochemical gold reserves to heal nearly instantaneously. They can survive extreme injuries such as flayings, decapitations, headshots, and even point-blank explosions. A gold fairing is known as a blood maker. Electrum allows a ferrochemist to store determination, causing them to enter a depressed state during active storage. They can tap their Electrum mind at a later time to enter a state of mania. An Electrum fairing is known as a pinnacle. Cadmium allows a ferrochemist to store breath. They must hyperventilate during active storage in order for their bodies to get enough air. They can tap their cadmium mind at a later time to eliminate or reduce the need for breathing. They can also use it to highly oxygenate their blood. A cadmium fairing is known as a gasper. Bind alloy allows a ferrochemist to store nutrition and calories. They can consume enormous amounts of food during active storage without feeling full or gaining weight. A separate bind alloy mind can be used to store fluids intake in a similar fashion. The ferrochemist can tap their bind alloy mind at a later time to go without the need to eat or drink while tapping the metal mind. A bind alloy fairing is known as a subsumer. Those are all 16 ferrochemical metals. If I could become a fairing, I would want to be a subsumer because I love eating and it would be a great way to take ultralight backpacking, one of my favorite hobbies, to the extreme. Let me know in the comments what type of fairing you would be. There's also god metals, which are made from the pure investiture of the various shards, but we only know the ferrochemical properties of atium from Mistborn Era 1, which is actually an alloy of pure atium and electrum. A ferrochemist can use that metal to store youth. They age while actively storing and can then tap that reserve at a later time to become younger. This can be useful when a ferrochemist needs to disguise themselves. If that ferrochemist can also allomantically burn atium, then they could compound their reserve to live for hundreds of years. It's not known what an atium fairing is called. The ferrochemical properties of all the other god metals are currently unknown. Origins and history of ferrochemy. Ferrochemy, like the other two metallic arts, came into existence as a result of the natural state of Scadrial and its interaction with preservation and ruin, the two shards who created the planet. Ferrochemy isn't more of one shard or the other, but is instead equally attuned to both, forming a balance between each. During the classical period of Scadrial's history, ferrochemy seemed to be the only magic system known to humans, with the power emerging in the spiritual genetics of the Terrace people. Because the Terrace people kept themselves so isolated, ferrochemical abilities never spread outside of their communities. Some of these early ferrochemists formed a group known as the Worldbringers, and they used their copper mines to amass knowledge, collecting tales of history and folk traditions from any source they could. Many considered the Worldbringers as holy men. Other ferrochemists of that era chose to use their powers to help them with their jobs as herders or mountain guides. Eventually, one of these terrorist ferrochemists named Rashik took the power at the Well of Ascension and changed the world. 
While holding the power of the well, he turned all living Ferrochemists, save one, into mist wraiths and made himself a mistborn. He chose to give blessing spikes to the mist wraiths that were once his close friends, turning them into the first generation of Khandra. He became the Lord Ruler and formed the final empire. He thought he had wiped out all other ferrochemists from Skadriel, but he hadn't accounted for the recessive ferrochemical genes within the still living Terrace people, so new ferrochemists were still born. Because of this, he heavily subjugated Terrace people from that point forward, forcing them into breeding programs in an attempt to eradicate ferrochemical genes. Despite all his efforts, ferrochemy was never wiped from the population, and some of these ferrochemists, inspired by the world bringers of the past, founded the secret order of the Keepers. They dedicated themselves to seeking out all the pre-ascension knowledge they could. The Terrace Keepers would wear four large copper bracers, two on the upper arms and two on the forearms. These copper mines contained the knowledge of all the history and religions prior to the Lord Ruler's ascension. This knowledge was passed down from Keeper to Keeper over the thousand years of the Final Empire. The Lord Ruler was eventually killed and his empire collapsed. The Keepers took this opportunity to come out of hiding and begin spreading the valuable knowledge they had been collecting in secret. This turned out to be a bad idea because Steel Inquisitors sought them out and killed them to create hemallergic spikes for themselves. Only one Keeper, named Sazed, survived. He eventually ascended, taking up the powers of the Shard's ruin and preservation and becoming Harmony. 300 years after Harmony's ascension, Mistborn Era 2 takes place, and ferrochemical genes have mixed with the general population, weakening them. So now only fairings are born. That concludes this deep dive about ferrochemy, the most versatile magic system in Mistborn. I've also made a video about allomancy. You can check that one out too if you haven't already. I'll put a link to it in the description. There's plenty more Cosmere content on the way, so be sure to give the video a like hit the subscribe button, and join me on this journey of exploring the Cosmere.